Hey, Professor Finn here. Uh, one of the questions I always get asked from my students, one of the most confusing things for me for whatever reasons, uh, because I'm a generally confused person, uh, in mortuary school was this formaldehyde exposure level stuff. Um, and so what I've done is I've created a tool that will help you get this right and give you a visual aid that you can draw very quickly to assist you on tests and for your national board exam. Now, the formaldehyde rule, the hazard communication standard, and the bloodborne pathogen standard. These are big OSHA chunks of what we need to know. Here at Miami-Dade College, uh, all of these things are taught in at least two classes. The first one is uh, FSE 2100, Embalming 1. It's Chapter 3 in the Embalming Book by Mayer. And we also have it taught in FSC 1080, which is the funeral law class. Uh, and that mortuary law book by Steve Gilligan has it in there as well. That's a whole chapter. Now, why this should concern you is because since it appears in both a sciences and an arts book, it is then in both of those subject categories for your national board exam. So it can be an embalming question or it can be a compliance regulatory question and can appear on both sections. So this stuff is insanely important for you. Let's go ahead and get started. So the OSHA formaldehyde standard specifically addresses hazards associated with exposure to formaldehyde in all of its forms. This is unlike the hazard communication standard, which deals with all the broad categories of chemicals. The way we monitor uh, exposure to formaldehyde is by sampling our workplace air. We do air testing. Uh, and we usually get our kits from our chemical supply companies who supply us with our uh, embalming chemicals. Some of us may use a third-party OSHA compliance specialist, but however you do it, you need to make sure it's getting done. When we do air testing in the workplace for formaldehyde, it has to be done under a worst-case environment. Now, this doesn't mean the next hurricane is blowing through. What it means is that it has to happen in a work shift when we're actually doing something. If we look at our first test, which we have here, the time-weighted average, this is the eight-hour test. It occurs during peak activities. So if you're given a scenario and you're given two or three different work shifts, you need to determine what the busiest shift for the prep room is, and that is the shift because that is the peak activity upon which you would do this eight-hour time-weighted average test. Within the TWA test, time-weighted average, TWA, we have three levels. We have compliance. Compliance is 0, 0.0 to 0 0.49, or many of us just say 0 to 0.49. And understand we do not round numbers. Whatever the number it gives you, that is the number you use. And if you're in compliance, go out and get a beer. Congratulations, you're doing fine work. Keep it up. Oh, you've been naughty. As soon as you hit 0 0.5, 0 0.5 parts per million, and all the way to 0.74 parts per million, you are now within the time-weighted average action level. And this is a warning zone where you need to get things back into compliance. So you need to take steps to reduce exposure. You begin medical surveillance, and you must retest within six months until you are in compliance. We're going to talk more about retesting shortly. Finally, <laughs> Godzilla showed up at your front door. You breached 0.75, and now you are in the permissible exposure level violation. You have crossed the threshold. Remember, do not round numbers. You have violated your PEL, your PEL, your permissible exposure level. Now you have to go all out. The first thing you have to make sure is you have signs on your work area. Doors leading into your prep room should have signs up saying danger from aldehyde, irritant potential cancer hazard, authorized personnel only. Generally, we put those in all of our doors anyways. Um, and understand, we do a test. We don't necessarily have to go in progression from an action level to a PEL violation. Okay? It can just be right on to a PEL violation. So we must begin medical surveillance, taking steps to reduce exposure. You have to provide respirators. Okay? Now, this is different than those N98 particulate face masks, which we should be wearing in our prep room while we're embalming. Those little face masks just protect us from inhaling and getting stuff in our lungs that can make us sick. It does not protect us from the fumes per se. Now, those 3M respirators that make you look like Bane from The Dark Knight Rises, that's what we're talking about. And those can be expensive. 
not only do you have to buy the respirators, you have to buy the filters specific for um, formaldehyde filtration, which are an additional expenditure for some of those. And they have to be fitted to the employee. You can't just go out and buy a bunch of size larges and hope they fit. That's not the way that works. Do not do that. Be very aware this doesn't fix the problem. This allows your employees to work somewhat comfortably because those face masks are really suffocating um, in the environment while there, are a, while there is a non-compliance issue going on. Your embalming book does not say this, but your law book does. At this level, when you breach the exposure limit, the permissible exposure limit, it's not just enough to take steps now. You need to do that, but you also must develop a written plan in which to do so. So be aware, now you have to write it down. The second test that we do is what's called a short-term exposure limit. This is done in addition to the time-weighted average and is almost universally done during the time-weighted average test during peak activity. However, you can't just willy-nilly pick 15 minutes and use it. The 15-minute test has to be done when you are actively embalming the body, which is when you are actively injecting chemical. Not just enough when you're wheeling the body in. You're not really embalming at that point. Embalming is the chemical preservation. So unless you're chemically preserving, you're not embalming. You should be very much aware when embalming is or is not. So look for that 15-minute period during embalming. That is always the right answer for the short-term exposure limit. This one is a little bit easier. There's only a compliance and a problem. So if you are in compliance, you are between 0 ppm, 0, 0.0 ppm, all the way to 1.9 ppm. This is testing to see if during embalming you're not letting fumes get everywhere. And if you're in compliance, there's nothing you need to worry about. However, the name of the test, short-term exposure limit, means that there is going to be an exposure limit as well. So the permissible exposure limit for the short-term 15-minute test is 2.0 ppm. Be aware, do not round numbers. Use the number you're given. So when we violate our permissible exposure limit, whether it's 2.0 for the 15-minute test or 0.75 for the 8-hour test, we have to throw up the signs, surveillance, respirators. Now comes the trick. If you are just in violation of the short-term test, you must retest within 12 months. Okay? Don't forget that written plan. That's also something you got to worry about. But the retest for the short-term exposure limit, if it is in violation 2.0 or higher, is within 12 months. When we retest, we at least do what we've already discussed, retest once within 6 months or 12 months respectively. Okay? When we have two tests that are done at least seven days apart, a week apart, and both tests are in compliance, we are now in compliance. So if we do another test, say, on Monday, okay, and on Monday our time-weighted average and our short-term exposure limit both show compliance, hey, we're good, but we're not good. Within that seven-day period, we cannot do another test. So I'd say, you know, Seven days later, the following Monday or the following Tuesday, depending on how nitpicky you want to get about when the day starts, we do another test. And if both air samples, the 8-hour test and the 15-minute test, show compliance again, we have satisfied the requirement. We are in compliance and we fixed our problem. Another trick tests like to throw at you is you need to retest the air when you have a substantial change in the prep room. Substantial change in the prep room means anything that substantially changes the work environment. New embalming machines, new vents, you had construction, or you had a personnel change. If you have new employees, a new embalmer working, you should probably retest on their ship. That would be important. So we've seen this medical surveillance term uh, thrown around a little bit. Be aware that a medical questionnaire has to be done by a licensed physician. You can't just send it to your cousin Vinny who works out of a toll booth or a phone booth and gives you your influenza shots, okay? This has to be a licensed person. Once the doctor has written off on you that you are okay, you can go back to work. However, if the doctor indicates you have an issue 
and will not release you, then we go into what's called a medical removal from the workplace. You cannot work in a prep room under medical removal for up to six months. Again, the doctor's going to tell you when they want to come see you and see what's going on with you. If there is improvement and you get better, they will release you back to work. However, after six months, if there's still no improvement, you're still not getting better, well, the employer has the choice of either reassigning you permanently to other duties not associated in the prep room, or they can terminate you. Isn't that lovely? Uh, of course, if they terminate you, uh, you probably have grounds for either a workman's compensation or disability claim. Uh, so that's not usually a route many places want to take. So, Professor Finn, you talked about um, being able to draw this on the fly so I can pass my test. That's really all I care about. Well, I hear you. Okay, that's all I cared about when I was in mortuary school. So the first thing you do is you draw yourself a fat square, okay? Draw yourself a rectangle. And then draw a line down the middle of it, horizontally, okay? Horizontally, that's the wide part. And you mark time-weighted average and short-term exposure limit, your 8-hour and 15-minute test. I always put time-weighted average on top, which you'll see why in a moment, but it doesn't matter how you do it. Draw a vertical line towards maybe the last third and write in your exposure limits, okay, your PELs. For the time-weighted average 8-hour test, that is 0.75. For the short-term exposure limit, it's 2.0. And you can see that right here. Now, draw a vertical line about that halfway mark or the, you know, two-thirds from the end, whatever you want to do. But draw it halfway down on your time-weighted average, your 8-hour test column. Market your action level, put the point five zero. You want to see these numbers to reinforce what's going on. We do not draw it on the short term exposure because it does not have an action level. You are in compliance or you have a problem. Now, don't take it for granted. Write down the compliance zones 0, 0.0 to 0.49. 0, 0.0 to 1.9. That would be important because if you do not do that, you might mix up the numbers. Now, you could additionally also mark where the action level stops, you know, that 0.74. But realistically, you see where you cross another threshold and that's all that matters. If it doesn't fall in there, it has to fall into one of the other two categories. For the sake of this graph, I add in some visual references. You don't have to do that, obviously, when you are doing something on a test, because you're not going to have colored pencils and, you know, I like my crayons, but they don't let me bring them into testing centers. Um, do this at home just to give yourself that added reference as to where things are at. Now, put in the remedial actions. So, under compliance, write it down. Nothing needs to be done. It is your brain reaffirming what is going on. Under the action level for the 8-hour test, write it down. Six-month retest, medical surveillance, exposure reduction. Okay? Then, under the exposure limits, write down all the other stuff. Written plans, signs posted, respirators, and be very careful here. Remember, a 12-month retest is required for an exposure of the short-term exposure limit only, but the 6-month retest is still what's necessary for the time-weighted average 8-hour test. So you need to differentiate between those two. I beat this into you now because it's so important. The 6-month retest is always required for the 8-hour test, whether it's a violation of the action level or the exposure limit. If you go and actually read the formaldehyde rule, it only mentions the 12-month test in reference to the short-term exposure limit. Why is this important? Because when you're given a scenario and you're asked to determine the proper test period, you need to see which one you fall in. If it's specifically asking you for a retest in regards to the time-weighted average, you know it has to be a six-month test if it falls into the action level or permissible exposure limit categories. If it's only a violation of the short-term exposure limit, it falls into a 12-month test. When you are given a word problem, it might ask you and give you violations in both tests and then ask you for a specific retest for a specific test. So if 
In, for instance, if I was in a time-weighted average situation and had a 0.8, which is a clear violation of the permissible exposure limit, and I have a short-term exposure limit with a 2.5, which is also a clear violation of the short-term exposure limit, and then the question at the end of the scenario asks me, what is the retest in the what period and what amount of time must I retest for compliance for the short-term exposure limit? It's a 12-month test for that. So don't put the six because you're also in violation for something else. The test question is asking you something very specific. If the test question just says, hey, same scenario, 8.0 for your time-weighted average, 2.5 for your short-term exposure, when should you retest? Err on the side of caution. Go for the shorter time period. You have to retest minimally within six months because that's what the time-weighted average test calls for. By having this chart in front of you, that will assist you with keeping this absolutely stone cold for you in the future. Using the two textbooks for references, Embalming History Theory and Practice by Mayer, the fifth edition, that's the orange cover. Although uh, the fourth edition or even the third edition probably have very similar things. They haven't really revised any of those things. Um, the Mortuary Law book by Gill, again, I'm using the latest. I think it's a 2012 or 2011 edition. Uh, and I didn't mention it, but I actually have looked at the formaldehyde rule off the OSHA website. Um, so understand, a lot of time and effort went in to try to define what these things are for you. I hope this helps. Best luck on your mortuary education. This is Professor Finn signing off.